This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Gentlemen, and welcome to the GSMC Sports Podcast, brought to you by the wonderful GSMC Podcast Network. Hope everybody had a great three-day weekend. If you had one, I know some people didn't. I had a three-day weekend, so I'm going to say it was a good three-day weekend. So we're going to jump right into it. Uh, so far, this week has not been as crazy as last week, so maybe we'll keep it that way. Maybe not. I know I've neglected the NBA all last week, but there were kind of good reasons for it because the MLB kind of crumbling under itself. And then, of course, you had the NFL going into championship weekend and then NHL firing half of their coaches in the league. So I apologize. But to start off today, we're going to be talking about we're going to be recapping the AFC championship game and the NFC championship game. After that, we'll talk about Kyrie Irving being crazy as always. And then we'll talk about the return of Zion, sort of return of Zion Williamson, his debut actually. Uh, then after that, we'll talk about Rutgers in college basketball, which is a thing that nobody's talked about in like in 40 years. And then, um, and then the last segment I'll talk about uh, my, my first thoughts. I watched the first part of the Aaron Hernandez documentary, so I'll give some of my thoughts on that. But first, let's talk about the Tennessee Titans versus the Kansas City Chiefs. And this game kind of started out pretty much like every other game the Titans have played in the playoffs this year. Uh, the Titans took a 10-0 lead. Uh, they took a 17-7 lead. Uh, it seemed like they were stopping the Chiefs every every time. Uh, the Chiefs have won big drive which is 10 plays 74 yards in the first quarter but uh it was 17-7 but then it was 17-7 with about seven minutes left in the half in the first half and uh, kansas city they were getting three and outs uh patrick mahomes was kind of struggling a little bit but then they get two touchdowns to go into halftime up 21-17 and this game so far is kind of reminiscent of the national championship game between lsu and clemson as uh Tennessee came out with a defensive game plan that stopped, for the most part, stopped Kansas City for the first quarter and and for, I mean, most of the second quarter. It just took until the end of the second quarter for Kansas City to kind of get things going, and then Kansas City never really looked back after that. Um, so, yeah, of course... Uh, nothing happened in third quarter. Literally nothing happened in third quarter. Uh, nobody scored, nothing. Um, and then the fourth quarter, Kansas City goes up 35-17 with their two touchdowns in the fourth quarter. And Tennessee scores a touchdown with about four minutes left to make it 24-35. So it's the end of the year for the Tennessee Titans as they did what nobody expected them to do, which is to make the AFC Championship game. No, No gripes here. Uh, they, they played really great games against the Patriots. They toppled the dynasty, as some people say. I don't think they did, but whatever. Uh, people can believe whatever they want to believe. So, Tennessee, they went out, they beat the Patriots, then they went out and upsetted the Baltimore Ravens, who are the hottest team in the league, and now they come up against posi- one of the best teams in the league, which is the Kansas City Chiefs, and they lose valiantly, I would say. Um, second half wasn't too hot for their defense, nor for their offense, but, they kept it reasonably close. They didn't get blown out by any means. Um, they just kind of went up against the buzzsaw. That is Patrick Mahomes. So, some comparisons here. Uh, so, some comparisons here. You got Ryan Tannehill, who actually threw for over 100 yards, which might be the reason the Titans lost. <laughs> um, he went 21-31, which is not bad at all. For 209 yards, he did get sacked three times. He threw for two touchdowns. He had a QBR of 74, which is okay. Um, but then you have it. And then the Chiefs did what I said needed to be done. You got to stop Derrick Henry. They held Derrick Henry to only like eight yards in the second half. 
eight yards. So Derrick Henry, of course, scored a touchdown to start the game. He, he scored the first touchdown, I believe. Uh, so he went 19 carries, 69 yards, one touchdown. His longest run was 13 yards. So they stopped Derrick Henry. Um, and that, that's all they needed to do. They needed to stop Derrick Henry, and look what happened. You have to make Ryan Tannehill try to win the game. And Ryan Tannehill is by no means a bad quarterback. I have stated that multiple times. I believe Ryan Tannehill is a pretty average quarterback. He's not one of the greats. He's not, he's not, he's not the new kid on the block in the AFC like Patrick Mahomes, Deshaun Watson, or Lamar Jackson. He's not one of those guys. He's a little too old to be the new kid on the block. Um, however, I do think he is a very, he's probably, he has the potential to be Kirk Cousins level of a quarterback, which is average to above average, depending on who they play. And that that's where I see Ryan Tannehill. He he kind of got held back, and I always knew he kind of got held back in Miami, thanks to Adam Gase. I always knew that. I always felt like that. Uh, I always felt that Ryan Tannehill was a good quarterback. He was just always hurt, and he was always playing for a offensive scheme that he didn't either didn't like or. Um, or didn't use him properly. Then you move over to the Kansas City Chiefs. Patrick Mahomes went 23 for 35, 294 yards, three touchdowns, sacked twice, um, QBR of 97.5. And that's, yeah. Uh, Patrick Mahomes also led in rushing yards. He had 53 rushing yards. He had that long 27-yard rushing touchdown. And then... Next up is Williams with 17 carries, 45 yards. The rushing attack wasn't going at all. Sammy Watkins had that huge touchdown, huge 60-yard touchdown catch um, from Patrick Mahomes where Patrick Mahomes was kind of like running around the pocket and then just slings it. (laughs) Patrick Mahomes is a cheat code, I swear. But there you have it. Tyron Matthew, the honey badger. Has a fantastic game as well. He actually tweeted out that the Titans ran a similar play that the Patriots ran that uh, scored a touchdown on the Chiefs earlier in the season. And uh, the Honey Badger snuffed it out and stopped that from continuing. But he had six solo tackles, one tackle for loss. So the Kansas City Chiefs, for the first time in 50 years, is going to the Super Bowl. I congratulates, congr- Congratulations to them. Uh, I think they are, they are definitely one of the best teams in the league. They, they're the number two seed in the AFC. Number one, of course, was the Baltimore Ravens, which, yeah. So Kansas City, I kind of expected them to do this last year, but they lost to the Patriots. Um, I kind of expected them to do this again this year. They were one of the favorites going into the season. Patrick Mahomes had that injury early on, and then uh, he came back and played like Patrick Mahomes again. People were. Cl- claiming that Patrick Mahomes was done. Uh, he was going through that sophomore slump, which is not a sophomore slump. This is the third year in the league, I'm pretty sure. So, there you have it. Kansas City in the Super Bowl. Pretty exciting to see Patrick Mahomes in the Super Bowl. Pretty exciting to see Andy Reid in the Super Bowl. As I am, a, as I mentioned before, I am a big Andy Reid fan. I liked him since he was in Philly. He's just a funny guy. I've heard he's super nice. Uh, he makes fun of himself, which I always like. Um... And I'm excited. Uh, now this is his second Super Bowl appearance as a head coach. His first one with the Eagles, and that didn't go so well, as you know. Um, so we'll see what happens. I believe in Andy Reid. I believe in Patrick Mahomes. But as we discuss in the next segment, they're going up against a way tougher team than they went up against here. So we'll see how that goes. Tennessee Titans, like I said. Not to be ashamed of it at all. They went nine and seven. They were going to be, if they won, they would have been the first team that started the season out two and four to make it to the Super Bowl. And Ryan Tannehill, that redemption arc was fantastic. I'm all about the stories. I love the stories. That's why I love sports. There's so many stories because you can take stories that happen in sports movies. But guess what? Most sports movies are based on true stories. So if you watch a sports movie and it's like a very unlikely thing that happened, more than likely it was based on a true story. They might have taken some liberties, of course, to make it a little bit more Hollywood, you know, a little bit more dramatic or a little bit more um, special, if you will. Um but for the most part, they're based on true stories. The, the the events that happen usually happen. Remember the Titans, fantastic movie, based on a true story. So there you go. Um, unfortunately, Rookie of the Year, the movie where a 10-year-old kid 
becomes an ace in Major League Baseball for the Chicago Cubs. That was not true. I don't think that was based on a true story. But Tennessee Titans, they had a really good season. Uh, they went 9-7. They didn't win their division, but they went farther than their division counterparts, the division winners, which is the Houston Texans, as the Houston Texans got beaten worse by Kansas City. So I think the Titans, pretty much all they had to do, I mean, obviously they were looking for a win, but consolation prize is you only lost by 11 to the potential Super Bowl winner in the AFC Championship game. When you were 9-7 and seven coming in in the wild card, you had to play the Patriots, you had to play the Ravens. They had the toughest schedule in the playoffs. And they come away with an 11-point loss against the Kansas City Chiefs, who everybody expected to be in the Super Bowl. So I don't... I don't think it's bad for them at all. I actually support them 100%. They're going to be interesting to watch next year with Ryan Tannehill getting another year under his belt. Then, of course, Derrick Henry being having a huge target on his back now. But next segment, we'll talk about the Packers 49ers game, which went pretty much how most people thought it would go. But we'll discuss it after the break. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. To the Packers versus the 49ers, which is a game that uh, kind of, if you look, if you just look at the box score and you just look at the stats uh, of the game, you would think it was the Tennessee Titans because uh, Raheem Mostert, Mo, Mustard, <laughs> sorry, uh, I've heard his name uh, pronounced a billion different ways. I think it's Mostart, Mostart, kind of like Mozart which he was definitely on Mozart on the field uh, Sunday night. So let's just get it out of the way. 29 carries for 220 yards, four touchdowns. He had four touchdowns. Um, so this game was pretty much all 49ers to start out. Uh, the whole first half was literally all 49ers. It could not have went any worse for the Packers. Um, so, yeah. So the 49ers, of course, score a touchdown, make it 7-0, uh, get a five-play drive out of the Packers, get a field goal 10-0, get a three and out for the Packers. Three and out for negative 11 yards, by the way. Make it 17-0. Packers then fumble the ball, give it right back to 49ers to make it 20-0. Then Aaron Rodgers throws an interception to make it uh, to give 49ers the ball again, make it 27 to 0, and then the Packers end the half with a three-play, one-yard drive that ends in a punt. So we're going into the second quarter. We're going into the second half, sorry. 27 to 0. And as I said in the episode on Sunday, which didn't go out until after the games, but if you listen to it anyways, but it's fine. Uh, I said, uh, you can never count Aaron Rodgers out. It's kind of like, uh, when Kansas City was down 24-0 to the Texans, you can't really count Patrick Mahomes out. Now, I don't think the, I don't think the Packers are good enough to come back from 29-0, so obviously they weren't. They started out the, they started out the second quarter with a touchdown drive to make it 7-27, to but then the 49ers come out and just give the ball to uh, Raheem Mostert of Mozart um, Mozart as he gets a 22 yard touchdown run to make it 7-34 to and then at that point it's kind of deflated Green Bay comes back out, scores another touchdown make it 13-34 
they get a three and out on the 49ers. And then Green Bay comes out again, scores again, makes it 20 to 34. So it's 20 to 34 with about eight ish minutes left in the game. That's doable. 14 points in eight minutes. Packers can do it. Aaron Rodgers can do it. But 49ers get a 10 play, four minute drive, almost five minute drive to get another field goal to make it a 17 point game and then Aaron Rodgers throws another interception and that's pretty much the game and ended 37 to 20 um like I said kind of a kind of an unexpected way that the 49ers won because I expected that Jimmy Garoppolo would have to do something to uh get the 49ers over that hump but Jimmy Garoppolo didn't have to do anything <laughs> Jimmy Garoppolo with six for eight, 77 yards. He got sacked once for eight yards, an eight yard sack. Um, and that's it. He threw the ball eight times. Eight. Let me repeat that. Eight. He had Ryan Tannehill numbers. <laughs> he had Ryan Tannehill numbers from, uh, I, I guess, I guess, um, the 49ers saw Tennessee and they're like, you know, and what they're doing is working. So let's just do that. So. Jimmy Garoppolo went 6 for 8, 77 yards, QBR 51.6, which is better than Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers went 31 for 39, which usually is pretty good. I mean, usually. Uh, he had 326 yards, two touch, threw for two touchdowns, but he threw two interceptions and also had a fumble. Uh, so they had three turnovers, and that was kind of the the acts there if they didn't get those turnovers then it could have easily been a three-point game or even they could have even won by four so three turnovers that really kills you uh 49ers capitalize off those turnovers so uh, i think off the top of my head i think every single turnover the 49ers scored right after it so 49ers got like 17 points off turnover or something like that so and guess what they won by 17 points so if you did those turnovers, turnovers are big. A lot of people don't realize that how big turnovers are in football. Um, they're they're pretty big, pretty big deal because uh, you need to take care of the ball. Because if you give the team another chance to score, they're probably going to take it. Usually, and most of the time, when teams get a lot of turnovers but they don't capitalize on them, they're not going to win because you pretty much wasted extra opportunities to win the game. 49ers did not waste this, so their defense did a fantastic job. Um, as always, let's see here. You got Bosa. Bosa had two solo tackles. He had one sack. Armstead had a sack. Then, uh, then Williams had a sack. Williams had seven solo tackles, two for a loss, one sack. So, this really brings up the question. Aaron Rodgers. He is 0-4. First of the 49ers, apparently. Um, he... Has only made one Super Bowl in his career. He's won it, of course, so good for him. But people are starting to question because you can't hide behind Mike McCarthy, and this 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 is all on Aaron because all three turnovers were on on Aaron Rodgers. So people are starting to think, "Is Aaron Rodgers done? Is it over?" And I'm going to say to that. Of course not. <laughs> he still threw for 326 yards. The three turnovers, of course. One interception was pretty bad. Uh, I feel like uh, he threw behind the receiver and linebacker got the interception. So that, that interception was bad. Uh, the fumble was his fault. Another interception, of course. So uh, Richard Sherman got an interception, I'm pretty sure, which is not the person you want to throw an interception to, obviously. Um, yeah, Richard Sherman got an interception. So... Um, so the interceptions, all the turnovers were pretty much Aaron Rodgers' fault. Um, it's just, you know, not a good look for Aaron Rodgers, of course, but at the end of the day, he's still one of the best quarterbacks in the league. I've seen a lot of people on Twitter com compare him with Tom Brady because Tom Brady's been to nine Super Bowls, yada, yada, yada. And to that, I say, if you go only by wins and only by playoffs, then yes. Tom Brady. If you only go by the win statistic and you only go by that, then yes, Tom Brady is better than Aaron Rodgers. But if you go by athletic ability, arm strength, uh, ability to make plays, Aaron Rodgers has it all day. And this is this is pretty much my 
view on everything in the quarterback and the GOAT argument, greatest of all time quarterback argument, because Tom Brady, yes, he has the accolades, he has the wins, he has the MVPs and all that stuff, but I'm never impressed by his actual athletic ability. There's never been... I mean, yes, of course, Tom Brady makes great throws. He can't be a quarterback in the NFL without making being able to make great throws. But there's never been a time where I'm just like, wow, no other quarterback can do that. Aaron Rodgers, on the other hand, he can run around in the backfield all he want, and then he can just throw back foot all the way across the field for 60 yards with a flick of the wrist, and it's a perfect pass. That's something not all the quarterbacks can do. Patrick Mahomes can do it now, obviously, but that is something not all quarterbacks can do. Whereas whenever I watch Tom Brady, especially in the past couple of years where it seems like he just throws quick routes, um, throws slants and stuff like that to Edelman or to Gronk or whoever, he, he doesn't really throw the deep ball that much anymore. When I look at that, I'm just kind of like, I mean, Ryan Tannehill can do that. Ryan Tannehill does do that. Uh, Sam Darnold could do that. Sam Darnold's probably not as smart. So there is definitely an argument. I'm not saying that Tom Brady's not the greatest of all time. I know some people are going to get a little butthurt about that. But what I'm saying is it depends what metrics you look at. If you're looking at pure athletic ability, if you're looking at the eye test, as the college football playoff committee puts it, if you're looking at the eye test, it's Aaron Rodgers all day. If you compare Aaron Rodgers playing football to Tom Brady playing football, then it's completely different. And then, I mean, I'll have people tell me that Tom Brady's the greatest football player of all time just because he's been to nine Super Bowls. He's won six of them, all that stuff. And to that I say, Jerry Rice. Jerry Rice played receiver until he was 45. And he's won, what, five Super Bowls or something like that? So Jerry Rice is easily the greatest football player of all time. I'm kind of derailed here, but, I mean, Jerry Rice kind of brings it back to the 49ers, I guess. But congratulations to the 49ers as they are making the Super Bowl. Possibly the best Super Bowl matchup we could have had is the 49ers versus Kansas City. It's going to be interesting to see that 49ers defense against Kansas City. And, of course, I will be mentioning the Super Bowl matchup plenty of times before the Super Bowl starts. And that Sunday of the Super Bowl, I will be doing a full in-depth analysis, just like I did for the college football playoff, where one segment will be for the 49ers, one segment will be for the Kansas City Chiefs, and then the la- the third segment will be my prediction for how the game's going to go. So it's going to be interesting how that goes. That's going to be in two weeks from now, though. So up next, finally talking about the NBA, first time in like a week, we'll be talking about Kyrie Irving. He Since it's MLK Day, or at the time I'm recording this, Kyrie Irving made a very weird comment about Martin Luther King. So we'll discuss that on the other side. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. GSMCpodcast.com for more info. Sweet, sweet Kyrie. Um, so Kyrie Irving, known kind of crazy person. Uh, I don't mean any harm by that, of course. It's just uh, I'm just joking. I don't think he's actually crazy. He has said uh, some suspecting stuff. Um, of course, you have the flat earther thing. He's a huge flat earth supporter, which if you're a flat earth supporter, more power to you. Um, but he is a flat earth supporter. Um and he made this recent comment about Martin Luther King as I'm recording on Monday, Martin Luther King Day. Um, he made this quote 
to the media about a couple days ago. So here's what he said. When I was out for those seven weeks, and not saying anything, but still people are out saying things about me. It's inevitable. You know they crucified Martin Luther King for speaking about peace and social integration. You know you can go back to historical leaders and great people in society who do great things, and they are still going to talk blank about them. It is what it is. So, he's comparing himself to Martin Luther King. For reasons, I suppose. So, I decided, is Kyrie backing up his, his, uh, backing up his talk by being like a good basketball player? Because we all know, I mean, he's a two-time All-NBA player. He won the NBA championship with the Cavaliers and LeBron. He's a six-time All-Star. He was an All-Rookie in his rookie season. And he now plays for the Brooklyn Nets. He played for the Celtics. He promised the Celtics that he was going to be there for a long time. He promised them he was going to lead them to championships and stuff like that. But he didn't, and then he left after a year. And now he's with the he's with the Brooklyn Nets with... Uh, Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant's, of course, still nursing his Achilles injury, so he's not going to play. But Kyrie Irving, he's the main guy. He, he's the guy. That was the thing he wanted to be in Cleveland. That's the thing he wanted to be in Brooklyn. That's the thing he wanted to be in Boston, I mean. And now this is the thing that he wants to be in Brooklyn. He wants to be the guy, although Kevin Durant kind of puts a, puts a little... Uh, wrench in that plan, but Kyrie Irving he's only played 15 games this year because of the he's been injured. Um, he's in those 15 games he averages 26 points. Uh, he averages 5.3 total rebounds, 6.9 assists. So not terrible. 45% field goal percentage. Uh, 36% for three points. Uh, for free throws he's 90 92%. So not too shabby. I mean he's not looking too bad, but. He's making these comments, and he, I feel like he's always making these comments, and I saw a great uh, mention of this on, I made uh, someone ask, I really wonder how Kyrie's teammates actually view him, because he does go out and say these random comments, these crazy comments, to, and it's crazy to a common person, and really, you got to think, how is, how is his teammates okay with this how does his teammates react to stuff like that when he says crazy things like this i don't know about y'all but when when if you're dealing with someone like that i mean especially if they're if they're the top player you kind of deal with it you just kind of deal with it if they're if they're the, the the top player they're the guy there but he's been hurt he's been inactive he hasn't played in a while i mean he's trying to get back He's trying to get back into the league, trying to get back to playing. And, yeah. Terry Rozier, who had a rough life, said that he lost his mind playing with Kyrie for a season and a half because Kyrie just kept saying weird things. And this brings me back to you got, you got the flat earth thing, which he refuses, he refuses to to acknowledge that the earth is round and then you bring up the fact that he went to duke duke by the way one of the best uh, uh, private institutions private universities in the country at least in the southeast i don't know about you um it's one of the best universities in the in the country that's not ivy league best non-ivy league institution it's a really good college but he does things like this that makes you think did he really deserve to be at Duke because you know Duke waves stuff just to you know get better basketball players because Duke cares about basketball a lot and you know it happens some schools um, unless they're Stanford some schools waive application stuff like that because you know they want a better football team or they want a better players for their teams for their athletics so stuff like that happens someone made a great comment on reddit that said Kyrie is the guy who thinks he's a lot smarter than he actually is so you you can bring up his throwing young teammates under the bus at Boston you can bring up um his promise of staying in Boston and then just one year later leaving um 
said the earth was flat and then doubled down on it, as I already said. Threw guys under the bus in Brooklyn, whether he meant to or not. Compared his situation of being um, trash-talked while out with an injury to MLK being trash-talked for speaking on social justice issues. He is comparing himself to one of the biggest one of the biggest figures, one of the best figures in American history. Martin Luther King Jr. One of the most important figures in American history who who went through terrible things fighting for social justice and and human rights and equality. And Kyrie is comparing himself to him just because he got hurt. Because people are trash talking him. That's insane. It's insane to me. Um, this whole situation, the whole Kyrie thing, um, people claiming he's trolling people, which I, I don't know. I watched the interview. He seemed pretty dead serious in this interview. Dead serious about it. Now, some people are saying it's nothing, which it probably is nothing. I'm probably just making something out of thin air. I mean, I just thought it was outrageous that uh, I learned about it today of all days on MLK Today. Um, the fact of the matter is, even if he is joking, you, this is not something you compare yourself to. You should never compare yourself to MLK just because you're being trash-talked about a sport. So, it's interesting I mean, some people, some people are making arguments for him. Some people are saying that uh, he, he's saying people will talk crap about you regardless of what you do or who you are. People will just talk bad about you, which is true. I'm going to be honest with you. That's true. People, there will be people that there will always be haters, no matter what, no matter what, how good you are, no matter what you do. There will always be haters. I know there's haters of Bill Gates. Bill Gates donates billions of dollars in charity his entire life and people are saying well he still he still could do more so I understand that part but just to me I feel like it was just ill timed um it's ill timed it's just it's just kind of weird and I mean he, he's still a pretty good basketball player we'll see when he gets back from injury fun fact I didn't know he was born in Australia did not know that don't know how I went without knowing that, but there you go. He was born in Australia, so good for him. So I apologize. He's been back for about three games, and in the past three games, he went um, went ten for eleven in field goals, 12, 12 for nineteen field goals, six for twenty one in his last game that happened on the fifteenth. Oh, sorry, he had another game on the eighteenth, which I think that's when he made these comments he played 30 plus minutes in the last three games so he is back in a certain capacity and he's playing pretty all right so there you go um so that's pretty much all i gotta say about Kyrie. next up we'll move on to zion williamson making his debut slash return to the nba i mean people are claiming it's a return but he got hurt before the season started so eh We'll talk about Zion Williams, the impact he will have on the New Orleans Pelicans. Hopefully, you'll go better than this segment. <laughs> See y'all. Stay tuned. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red-hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy-football-podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Is starting tonight, Tuesday, 
be – well, no, he's starting Wednesday. Sorry, I apologize. Uh, he is going to be starting in the next New Orleans Pelicans game. And everybody's excited about it. ESPN's excited about it. Fox is probably excited about it. CBS – TNT probably. I mean, everyone's excited about this because he Zion Williamson is one of the most hyped players to enter the NBA since LeBron James. So it's exciting. Obviously, everybody's hyped about it. He had a fantastic time in at Duke. We'll talk about another Duke player. Um, he had amazing time at Duke. Amazing year at Duke. Um, they didn't win. A national championship or anything, but he was the number one pick in the draft to go to the New Orleans Pelicans. Um, Everybody thought he was going to go to the Knicks. Everybody thought he was going to go anywhere but the Pelicans, but the Pelicans won the lottery. Pelicans got the number one pick, and they picked the obvious choice, which was Zion Williamson. So, what is the... uh, what are, what are we expecting here? So he underwent knee surgery before the season started, of course. That's why he has not played at all this year. Before he went out, he played for four preseason games, and he kind of tweaked his knee during the preseason games, and that's what led to the uh, surgery and all that. So, so his stats in the preseason games that he played in, the four that he played in, uh, so he went... He averaged 23.3 points on 71% shooting with 6.5 rebounds in in those in the four preseason games. So the main question is, how are the Pelicans going to use him? So the Pelicans have been kind of getting by. They have Brandon Ingram, who's playing pretty pretty great. Lonzo Ball is playing playing pretty great. Um, But great kind of overstated, actually, because the Pelicans are 16-27 and at the moment. They are 11 games under 500. They are 12th in the Western Conference. So, by great, I mean they're great for what they've been doing. Baron Ingram's been playing better since his time with the Lakers. Uh, Lonzo Ball's been playing a little bit better. Josh Hart is okay. Then you have Drew Holiday and J.J. Redick, the veteran presence on the team. They are playing as they usually play. So, how are they going to use Zion when he gets finally starts playing, which he will start playing Wednesday? Um, So, one thing that people are saying is that he could get the uh, Giannis treatment when he does start playing. Uh, so basically what happens to Giannis is they play, they give him a load management so he could still be fresh for most of the game and fly around and make these amazing plays that Giannis does. So they could give Zion a very similar load management. Um, expect around 20, 25 minutes in the first few games because, you know, you still got to get him up to speed because remember, he has never played in a real NBA basketball game. So that learning curve that most players have to go through by now, they're usually pretty good. Um, he still has to go through that learning curve. There is still a learning curve that he has to go through. And then on top of that, he's also rehabbing that knee, which he's kind of already rehabbed. I mean, he's got, he's given the full go. He's 100% to play for the Pelicans in the upcoming game. So at first, it's going to be very little time. And it's really going to be interesting to see if he actually makes an impact. He made a huge impact on the preseason games, but those are preseason games. Actual NBA games are going to be completely different. Um, but then again, people said that about um, he played at a small Catholic school in Spartanburg, South Carolina. People said that when he moved up to Duke, went to Duke, started playing on these ACC schools. They said, oh, he's got to adjust to it, blah, blah, blah. We'll see how he actually, how good he actually is. Then they said the same thing when he moved up to the Summer League. We'll see how actually good he is when he moves up to the Summer League. Then he dominated the Summer League, and now people are saying the same thing. He's moving up to the actual NBA, and people are wondering, is he actually going to be good in the actual NBA? So it's kind of old news at this point for Zion, I feel like. He's going through the same same old song and dance that people have gone through. He's gone through for the past three years, pretty much, because he was in high school three years ago. So, actually, two years ago, he was in high school two years ago. So, I mean, this is something he's been going through the past couple of years. Everybody keeps saying, no, "There's a lot of non-believers when it comes to the Zion Williamson camp." But I can tell you. I never got to watch him in person, unfortunately. I live near where his high school was. I never was interested in actually going to see a random high school kid play basketball. That's just not my thing. Um, 
I live near, w- near where he is. Um, I wanted him to go to Clemson because he Clemson was definitely a big target, uh, or he was a big target for Clemson. He did not. He chose Duke over Clemson, which I'm still upset about, but it's okay. Um, he chose Duke over Clemson, which smart move on his part, I suppose. But so he goes to Duke. Uh, played really well at Duke. I never got to see him. I saw him on TV, of course, but never got to see him live because Duke did not come to Clemson, and I wasn't going to drive up to Durham to go to a Duke game. Uh, so I never got to see him in person. But what I've seen of him on television and during the NCAA tournament, during any Duke game against the game he played against Clemson at Duke, at Cameron Indoor, he's a monster. This kid is a monster. He is nothing like I've ever seen before. He, you can compare him to LeBron, but I think he's a little bit more physically gifted than LeBron was at this age. Because LeBron James, he, he he was athletically gifted, but physically. I compare him kind of to Shaq. He's like a leaner Shaq. Because when Shaq first joined the NBA, he was big. He was athletic. He could do all this crazy stuff. Zion's kind of like that. That's how I would describe. So I so the impact that he's going to make on the Pelicans, I feel like is going to he's going to bring a lot of attention to himself because I feel like a lot of teams don't want to be shown up by Zion. Uh, remember, he is still the number one pick in the NBA draft, and in the NBA in basketball, one player can change a team dramatically. So having Zion in the game is going to open up avenues for Brandon Ingram for Drew Holiday, for J.J. Redick. He's going to get more open shots for them on the outside and then also help with rebounds and stuff like that. It's going to be very interesting how they use him. Like I said, he's only going to be 20, playing 20 to 25 minutes. So it's going to be very interested in how the Pelicans, how um, Alvin Gentry uses him. The Pelicans still have a chance at making the playoffs. Now, there's been arguments. Should the Pelicans even try to make the playoffs? This is a young team. Um, you have Zion, who's who you don't want to get injured again. You kind of want him to go through uh, the rest of the season unscathed, so he can spend the whole off season getting better and getting full, fully recovered from this knee injury. So it's going to be very interesting how they use him. They could make the playoffs. They're just twelfth. Um, I don't know how many games out of the uh, eighth uh, out of the playoffs they are, but. They're twelfth in the Western Conference. Let's see here. How many games are they out? They are out. They're only out four games from the eight eight seed. Only out four games, which is the Memphis Grizzlies, who have John ja Morant on their team, who's another fantastic rookie. He was drafted second overall behind Zion, and he's playing fantastic. So the Pelicans can make it. That's the bottom line. With this terrible record, um, they could still make it. They could, they still have a chance. They, well, actually, they're probably more than four games out of the uh, playoffs, but uh, they're about four and a half, according to basketballreference.com. So they still have a chance, and Zion is good enough to get them into the playoffs. He is good enough. Like I said, basketball is a completely different sport. When you, when you have a team like the Cleveland Cavaliers and you just add LeBron onto it, all of a sudden, they're making the, the NBA championship, NBA finals, every single year. And then LeBron leaves, and then they're back to being bad. Back to playing not well. Back to um, pretty much irrelevancy. So, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's interesting because one, te- one player can really change a lot in the NBA. And Zion can change a lot for the Pelicans. So, the Pelicans are definitely going to be team to watch the Pelicans game when Zion makes his debut is going to be much must watch even though he's probably not going to have that much activity in the game because like I said they're kind of rehabbing him they're kind of slowly getting him in you have that learning curve of playing in the NBA which he still has to get used to and then of course you have the knee situation that they need to focus on so there's a lot of deterrence to Zion Zion's new Zion's debut but it's still going to be exciting he's one of the most exciting young players in the league and we haven't even seen him play a game the fact that this many people are still talking about him even though he's been injured for the whole year most most players will get forgotten about for the whole year but no we've been talking about Zion this entire time how are the Pelicans going to be with Zion how how is Zion going to play in the NBA and stuff like this so there you have it um like I said, it's going to be interesting to watch. 
and I, for one, am excited. I will tune into it probably. I'll tune in for the 2025 minutes that Zion plays, and we'll see how it goes, and we'll see if the Pelicans will get over that hump and get to the top. So up next, we'll be talking more basketball, but we're going to college, we're going to collegiate level, as college basketball has been chaotic this year, and we're going to be talking about Rutgers being ranked in the top 25 for the first time since 1979. Are you looking to get your college football fix? Looking to get the latest news on your favorite school's team? The GSMC College Football Podcast is your ticket to all things college football. Join us as we talk college football from the national championship, the college rivalries, the bowl game, to the Heisman Trophy, to which conference is the best. We've got you covered for the Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, the Pac-12, ACC, and everything in between. Download the GSMC College Football Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Move on to college basketball, which I haven't talked about a lot recently because, you know, there's so much football going on and I'm more of a football guy, but I love college basketball. I love March Madness. I love the uh, craziness that goes on in college basketball at all times because they play so many games and, and so many emotions are a part of it. Uh, people don't realize how much uh, random stuff happens in college basketball throughout the season, uh, especially if you only tune in for March Madness because when you watch March Madness, it's just kind of like... It's just kind of like, you know, you got the same old teams as the number one, number two seeds. And you like seeing them getting upset in the tournament, but you don't realize that they kind of go through a rough patch during the season as well. So, for instance, I mean, this season is crazy so far. Um, North Carolina, who's a blue blood, they, they've they won many national championships. They're always at the top of the ACC. They are currently last place in the ACC rankings with losses to Clemson, uh Losses to Clemson. Uh, Wake Forest lost the other day to take. North Carolina's one and five in the ACC right now, eight and nine overall. They're under five hundred as a basketball team. Um, let's see. Uh, they have losses to Michigan, which is not a bad loss at all. Oregon, not a bad loss at all. Ohio State, not a bad loss at all. Um, but then you lose to Virginia, which is not a bad loss. You lose to Wofford for like the third year in a row or something. Uh, lost to Gonzaga, who Gonzaga is like the current number three team in the country or something like that. Then you lose to Georgia Tech. You lose to Pittsburgh. You lose to Clemson. You lose to Pittsburgh again. And they play Virginia Tech uh, tomorrow night on Wednesday. So North Carolina is kind of in a rough patch. And then you have Ohio State, who is who is twelfth in the Big Ten, they've kind of gone through a rough patch recently. They beat Kentucky on December twenty first, but ever since then they went on a, a four game lose streak uh, to West Virginia, Wisconsin, both pretty good. Wisconsin's a really good team. Maryland, Indiana, beat Nebraska, lost to Penn State. Uh, so Ohio State is currently um, one. They are currently twelfth in the Big Ten. So, crazy things are going on currently in college basketball. So, that brings me, we're going to stay in the Big Ten. Ohio State is 2-5 and of the Big Ten. That brings me to the number two team in the Big Ten. It is the Rutgers Scarlet Knights. So, you must be wondering what's so special about Rutgers, something like that. They're 14-2, they're 5-2 in the Big Ten. The Big Ten. Uh, they've beaten three top 40 Ken Palm teams so far this year they've beaten wisconsin which like i said they're a pretty good team they beat seton hall and they beat penn state uh they just took a victory sunday night over minnesota they play iowa coming up and then nebraska the purdue then you play michigan maryland northwestern this is the rest of their schedule by the way they play ohio state they play illinois play michigan again wisconsin again penn state maryland purdue so they kind of have a tough rest of the schedule they're facing big, the best big 10 teams uh ohio state even though they're down right now they're still a very good team going into it so they have a rough schedule going ahead but they are ranked in the top 25 for the first time since 1979 i believe that i read that off a tweet so 
Don't know that's completely true. Uh, they haven't made the NCAA tournament since 1991, so they have a really good chance, especially with uh, the ACC being down. Uh, the ACC being down, SEC is kind of down too, so the Big Ten have a really good chance of getting two-thirds of their conference into the NCAA tournament. But knowing the ACC, some of those teams will, of course, rise up and take most of those spots, as the ACC usually takes most of the spots in the NCAA tournament. But Rutgers has a really good chance at making the tournament, especially with this great start. They're 14-4, 5-2 in the Big Ten. They have a good chance at winning the season, the Big Ten season title, if they can continue this play going. Um, So they score 71 points per game. That's ranked 190th out of 353. So, I mean, it doesn't sound that impressive. And then you realize there's 353 colleges in college basketball then you go on to points allowed they've allowed 58.7 points a game which is seventh overall out of 353 teams so that in itself is very impressive so this Rutgers team is very surprising and it just brings me to the overall point that College basketball's weird, man. This year's weird. It just is. So uh, currently, here's the top 25. We're, we're going to go down the list of top 25 teams. Uh, some of them make sense. Some of them do not. Uh, you got Baylor at number one. They're 15 and one. And this this poll came out Monday. This is brand spanking new. So anything happens between now and uh, between right now, as you're listening to this, and whenever someone one of these top five eventually lose, then yeah. So. Baylor's number one, 15 and one. Uh, they were ranked number two last, last week. Uh, they're hailing from the Big 12, of course. Gonzaga. Gonzaga's always a big team in NCAA basketball, 20 and one. Then you got Kansas, who's 14 and three. They've had some ups and downs so far this year. San Diego State, the only undefeated team in college basketball. They are 19 and 0, and they hail from the Mountain West. They jumped up from seven to four here in the AP poll. Is pro- I think this is probably the highest they've ever been ranked in the AP basketball poll. Then you have Florida State at five. Florida State, they've been a program that's been steady, steadily getting better and better each year. They're 16 and 2 right now. They're in the ACC, so they still have a tough ACC schedule to play as ACC play has just begun. Then you have Louisville, 15 and 3, also hail from the ACC. Then you got Dayton at 16 and 2. Um, they're from the Atlantic 10. Dayton's usually one of those teams that you always see when you make your March Madness bracket, and you're kind of like, should I pick up? I feel like I pick a Dayton in the first round every year. I feel like it's just one of those things because I, I think I've been scorned by them. I think they always beat the team. They're, they're always one of those seven. Seven seed or twelve seed teams that play a team that they're very close to, even though their rankings aren't close. But I feel like Dayton always wins the first round, so I always choose Dayton in the first round of the tournament. Now I'm not telling you to do that. I'll, I'll do a whole March Madness show once we get close to that. But I'll, I'll, I'll do my I'll do a whole show basically just picking bracket, picking my own bracket, and y'all can argue with me, y'all can agree with me. I'm probably not going to go in depth because that's a lot of games to choose in a very short period of time. I might drag it around for two shows, two edition, two shows, you know. But anyways, Duke is number eight. Duke got upset by Clemson at Little John Coliseum in Clemson, South Carolina. So they moved down from three to eight. And I feel like this has been Duke's season all year. They kind of, they, they started up at number three, number two or whatever. Then they lost, dropped down, and then they worked their way back up. The loss dropped down, and they worked their way back up, and then they lost again. So Duke's ranked number eight. Then you have Villanova at nine, Seton Hall at 10, Michigan State at 11, Oregon at 12, Butler at 13, West Virginia 14, Kentucky at 15. Kentucky took a loss to South Carolina recently. Um, so they dropped to 15. Auburn, has been kind of on a skid recently. They lost to Alabama. They lost to someone else that I can't remember off the top of my head, but they went from 4 to 16. They dropped 12 spots in one week, so they, they're going through a rough patch right now. Maryland stayed the same at 17. They are 14 in 4. And then we have Texas Tech, who went from 23 to 18. Iowa, who went from unranked to 19. And then you got Memphis, went from 22 to 20. Illinois still up there is 24 to 21. Arizona's 22. 
from unranked to 22. Colorado went from 22. They fell three spots, 20 to 23. Then you have, of course, Rutgers being ranked for the first time since 1979. Then, last but not least, in the top 25, you have Houston. Others receiving votes are Wichita State, LSU, Michigan. Michigan's kind of gone through a downturn, downward spiral recently. So has Ohio State. Uh, then you have Stanford, Wisconsin. Wisconsin's struggling right now. Penn State's kind of struggling. Big Ten's filled with a bunch of teams that are kind of struggling, but they're still good. They're still good. They could probably beat um, plenty of other teams. It's just it's just a waiting game. They're all going to kind of cannibalize themselves. So we'll, we'll see if the Big Ten actually does get two-thirds of their conference in the NCAA tournament. So that will be interesting to see. It will be interesting to watch. Big Ten is definitely the conference to watch at the moment as uh, ACC is kind of interesting. you got Duke, you got Louisville, you got Florida State who kind of popped up out of nowhere. Uh, it will be interesting to watch those guys too, but uh, the Big Ten is the most interesting to me at the moment. Um, so, yeah, and then Purdue is also receiving votes. Indiana is receiving some votes. And then Harvard has one vote. So that's the AP Top 25 in college basketball. It's been a crazy year so far. I feel like the number one team loses almost every week or every other week. So Baylor, watch out. Baylor is probably going to lose to someone here sooner or later. Uh, I'm going to try to pull up their schedule real quick. Um, But, yeah, it's been a crazy year so far. And it's just going to get crazier as we get closer to March. And, of course, March Madness is always, you know, as they say, mad. So, um, so yeah, Oregon plays USC Southern Cal on Thursday, the 23rd. That's going to be a huge matchup. It's at 11 o'clock. Um, I think USC is currently number two in the conference. Oregon's not even in the top. <laughs> Oregon's not even in the top of their conference currently as you got Stanford and USC both four and one 15 and three teams so Pac-12 is also very interesting to look at college basketball is just fantastic and I'm going to pay t- more attention to it now because college football is over uh NFL is coming to a close so uh, so hockey and college ba- basketball are going to be my uh go-to stuff I always start watching those after after uh football ends so It'll be interesting to see that. When we come back from this break, I will give you some first thoughts on the Aaron Hernandez documentary on Netflix as I am currently watching it right now. I'm halfway through the second episode as we speak right now. So we'll talk about that later. Check out the show built around the women of MMA from the UFC, Invicta FC, Bellator, and one championship. We got the fights covered. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts, past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. So if you've been listening to any sports media in the past couple days, you might have known that there's a new Aaron Hernandez documentary on Netflix. It came out about last week. Uh, it's called Killer Inside, the Mind of Aaron Hernandez. So if you don't know, of course, Aaron Hernandez is a former tight end for the New England Patriots. Uh, he played for the Florida Gators with Tim Tebow back in the day. He played for the Patriots, uh, almost won him a Super Bowl or something like that, and he received like this huge contract to continue playing with the Patriots. This is the time when Patriots also had Gronk, like they just drafted Gronk or something like that. So he was a really good tight end for the Patriots. He was insane at Florida. This documentary showed like clips of him playing at Florida and it was insane. He played so fantastically. Uh, he was a really good football player and it really, and he, it turns out he murdered three people while he was playing for the Patriots and people were wondering how this happened and this documentary goes in depth on that and uh, I'm currently watching I'm halfway through the second second episode so I don't have like a full review for you I probably won't give you a full review this is not going to be a, a movie review segment uh, this is more of me talking about 
how the Aaron Hernandez situation kind of went down with me and my friends. Because well, so when this all went down, I was in high school, and you know, high school, high school kids, teenagers, they kind of take things less seriously because they they don't have to worry about adult things like this. Um, when this happened, I definitely remember there were jokes going on. Um, I had a friend who was a big Patriots fan. We would talk to him all the time, and we would just be like, "So." Aaron Hernandez, and he would just he he would just be like, I hey, allegedly they have not proven anything, so allegedly became an inside joke between me and my friends. Uh, anytime something happens, we'd be like, allegedly. So, um, so he would keep saying that. He kept saying that whenever we brought up uh, Aaron Hernandez, and I, I made a couple notes while I was watching this. And the first note I made, it was very interesting how this has been going on. This was going on when Tim Tebow was on the Patriots. Uh, so Aaron Hernandez was. A teammate of Tebow on the Florida Gators, they won, you know, national championship or two. You know, no big deal. It's Tim Tebow on on the Florida Gators. He, they were a cheat code. They're the they're the big team. They had Irvin Meyer as the coach. They had a lot of great players. They had Percy Harvin. They got stuff like that. Uh, Tim Tebow, one of the greatest college football quarterbacks of all time. Um, you can't really dispute that either. I mean, he's up there. Uh, there's only a couple quarterbacks you can put above him. And I don't want to hear Joe Burrow in the conversation because one good season does not constitute you being the greatest college football quarterback of all time. You have a really good season, of course, but you need to, to be one of the best. You have to be playing pretty much since your sophomore year at least and play three or more years and win national championships and win Heisman, which Joe Burrow did too, did all the, did those things. He, but Joe Burrow kind of had a breakout season. Anyways, I don't know why I'm talking about that. Um, <laughs> so Aaron Hernandez was teammate with Tim Tebow. And it was very interesting to me that this all went down when Tim Tebow was doing his whole playing for the Patriots thing. He was, he was like the fourth string quarterback for the Patriots. Uh, he got cut later. Bill Belichick went up to him and was like, Hey, I want you to play. Uh, tight end, and he was like, no, I want to play quarterback. And then he got cut because why <laughs> he didn't listen to Bill Belichick because why would you not listen to Bill Belichick? <laughs> Anyways, uh, so that was the first big note for me. I thought it was just very interesting how Tim Tebow, who is held in this very high regard as a very good Christian uh, man, uh, waiting for marriage to do, you know, sexual relations and, and just, you know, usually never having problems. His only problems have always been on the football field, which are minuscule in comparison to what Aaron Hernandez did, you know? Uh, at some point, football just doesn't matter anymore. And that's kind of what happened in this Aaron Hernandez situation. Then, second point I note, hernandez or whatever it was called. You know, when you, like, just put, like, you don't put your arms through. Because when he was arrested, he was arrested probably shirtless and the cops were just like okay let's put a shirt on him so they just put like a white shirt on him and like he didn't have his hands through the armholes so he just had like his hands behind his back and they just put like a shirt on him that became like a fad it was like a meme on social media it was one of those challenges it was a hernandez challenge it was like the planking challenge it was kind of like that and it, and looking back on it that is so weird that's like if when oj simpson was getting chased in his white Bronco that people started speeding on the interstate in white Broncos and calling it the white Bronco challenge or something like that. I I don't really have a good scenario or like, or like people like trying on gloves that are too small for them and calling it the OJ Simpson challenge or something like that. Like it's just bonkers to me that this man is literally getting arrested for potentially being a murderer and people are making memes out of it. I saw the pay now, Obviously, I'm okay with you supporting a sports a- an athlete when they are in trouble, if they have not been convicted yet, if they are not proven guilty. It is fine. If they if they first get arrested and you just want to show support, show them that they still have like a fan base behind them, that's fine, I suppose. There are Patriots fans outside the courtroom and stuff like that. They're yelling, yeah, we love you, Aaron. Woo! Still kind of weird to me, though. Of course, the Patriots had a jersey exchange <laughs> where if you had an 81 jersey, they didn't say, it didn't say it had to be in Hernandez, but if you had a jersey that was, na- had number 81 on it, you can exchange it for a new one, which is great. Uh, so a lot of teams do that whenever something weird happens, like a big player leaves or, or there's like a out- public outrage or something like that. So good for them. Good for the Patriots for doing that. I just, it was interesting. There's a, my other thing is there's an interesting angle that this uh, documentary is going through, and it's pretty much 
saying that Aaron Hernandez had repressed homosexual tendencies. They were pretty much saying that he was repressed. He repressed his homosexuality. Um, there is a former offensive lineman from the NFL who came out and he said that there's such thing as a beard, which is basically you date a woman to as a cover up. And he said it was typical of over masculine guys hiding their homosexuality by marrying a woman and having a child. And then there was a the quarterback from his high school mentioned that they had homosexual relations. Like if he if they were in a more progressive time, they would have said they were dating at the time. And I don't have any issue with homosexuality at all. I just feel blindsided by this. I'm watching this documentary to find out like why why did this man murder people and um, like why did this high profile football player turn to a life of violence and murder people murdered people very stupidly by the way the, the details in this documentary like he murdered a he murdered one guy like half a block away from his house in a very rich neighborhood where nothing like this happens uh, and then he put like a bullet in gum or something like that and like he just put the gum underneath the paneling of a rental car that was rented in his name just stupid stuff was going on um but like i'm just trying to figure out why this is all happening and i kind of get blindsided by this homosexual angle that they're going for saying that he's repressed his homosexuality and that it was makes him frustrated and that's one of the reasons why uh it led to this and it just kind of blindsided me. I wasn't expecting it. I wasn't expecting that at all. I just that's just an interesting thing I put uh, put in a note. I thought it was just a one time thing, but then they bring it up later in the second episode. So it, it kind of makes sense now that I've watched it a little bit more. But I'm just saying it is kind of blindsiding. So if you watch the documentary and you get very confused by why they're talking about him repressing his homosexuality, it makes sense later. Don't worry, it'll be all right. But. Like I said, this happened while I was in high school. We joked about it. Uh, we have, uh, there, there's a YouTuber. I forgot his name is Kent, Kent, uh, Bays, not Kent Basemore, but, uh, oh man, Coach Kent, something like that. He, he, he makes funny baseball videos on YouTube and he has this video where he hits home runs and it's like what you should say after you hit a home run. And one of them is gone forever. He hits a home run and he hits a home run and he yells gone forever. Aaron Hernandez. This is before he committed suicide, of course, in prison. Um, but we thought it was hilarious at the time. I still kind of think it's hilarious. Um, that's just cause I have a personal connection to it because it's, it's an inside joke between me and my friends. So, um, so we would joke about it, and, and looking back on it now, it's a much more serious situation. And it might be the fact that we just heard the headline, and we didn't. None of us really read more into it. We just kind of heard that he got arrested, heard that he murdered these people, and we just read headlines. We didn't read into it. We didn't read into facts or anything like that. And my friend still says allegedly, because technically Aaron Hernandez was never convicted. Of, I don't think he was ever convicted officially. So. There you have it. It's a really good documentary so far. It goes very in-depth. Right now they're talking about his time at Florida, which is interesting to me because he went to a bar, punched the owner of the bar in the face, and didn't get charged or didn't have to pay his tab. So, you know, uh, football problems, I guess. So that's it for this Tuesday edition of the GSMC Sports Podcast. You can rate, review us, or like us. Do whatever. Please on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts, of course. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Strickland underscore Josh. You can follow GSMC Sports, GSMC underscore Sports on Twitter as well. We'll get more updates from us on different sporting events that have grown on in the world. And then, of course, follow all of GSMC Podcast Network on social media if you wish. And that will be it for me today. I'll talk to you guys on Thursday. Hope you have a great Tuesday. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.